We had Dr. Kevin McHale from uh, Cape Regional and Penn Orthopedics on the show. He was nice enough to jump on the show pretty much immediately when that news came down. He kind of explained a well, little bit to Hopefully he us. invoiced you. <laughs> he is able to explain better for us. Yes. And one of the things that Mitch Lawrence brought up in our conversation with him just a couple of minutes ago was this notion that a lot of people have kind of scoffed at. Why does it take 10 different doctors? And we talked about that with Dr. McHale, Doc, on Tuesday's show. And just to kind of reaffirm, because a lot of people have been talking about this over the last couple of days, that you don't find it all that bizarre that it might have taken 10 guys that one of them may have said, this is what the problem is, that nine other guys may have, may have in fact missed that. You feel that that is common. Yeah, you know, unfortunately for this particular condition, uh, it's not uncommon at all. So um, this is one of those diagnoses that we call a diagnosis of exclusion, you know, meaning that there's a lot of common reasons why athletes will have pain, and this is definitely not one of them. So thoracic outlet syndrome, as we talked about, is a, is a compression of either nerves or blood vessels as they exit the neck and, and get, enter towards the arm. And it's uh, more common seen, commonly seen in swimmers and baseball players. There's a couple of high-profile baseball players that have had it, but even when you look at those um, sports, like some of the bigger baseball players like Matt Harvey that had it, typically they'll deal with these symptoms for months without getting diagnosed, even though it's more common in those sports, just because it's so atypical. And uh, we touched on some of the reasons for that on Tuesday, but the fact that thoracic outlet syndrome when the nerves get compressed, the brachial plexus, where all these little nerve roots are combining and forming the nerves that go into the arms, where they're getting compressed, it leads to this really variable set of symptoms where pain in different places and numbness and tingling going down the hand that's not quite as specific as when somebody has, say, a pinched nerve in their elbow like Marcus Mariota or a pinched nerve in their neck like we talked about it with a, a few of the uh, athletes over this year. So. It's not uncommon at all, unfortunately, for it to be, uh, you know, for them to try to treat these more common problems first and then ultimately settle on this as the diagnosis after the treatments for those more common injuries uh, weren't successful. Do we have a long, maybe not even a long doctor, but do we have examples? And I'm not even asking for specifics. I'm just using your expertise and your own history and your reach. But in baseball, do we, is it often, is it common for somebody to be misdiagnosed and then correctly diagnosed. I'm, I'm trying to equate the timeline with faults to baseball players and other athletes who have maybe not gotten the initial diagnosis of this and then later, but is it more a case of misdiagnosis and then through other eyes, hey, this is what's wrong, or is it just never picked up, meaning we don't know what's wrong with you, you're going to have to give it more time. Sure. So, so I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that sometimes, like for example, pitchers, okay, they, there was a study on pitchers that uh, had this condition. There was about 13 of them that had it treated in the uh, Major League Baseball, came out last year, and uh, about 10 of the 13 did get back to play um, after having a surgery for it specifically. These are all guys that had surgery. Um, but a lot of times it takes a while to, to pick up on this condition. So, for example, I think there was a Padres pitcher a couple years ago that had this condition. And it took all season for them to diagnose it. Now, Fultz, it took a little bit longer, obviously. You know, we're into the second season dealing with this problem. That probably has something to do with the fact that it's just much less common in basketball. You know, pitchers put a lot of force to, to pitch the ball. That motion, uh, specifically that repetitive overhead motion, is much more likely to cause this problem. So in a, a basketball player, you're just much less likely to think that this is the cause. And there's the no pain. The thing is... There's no pain in that movement with the pitcher throwing the ball 98 miles per hour and dealing with this condition? No, they will have pain. They can have pain. They can have numbness and tingling. Right. But it's unclear of the, the source of it. So, for example, in a pitcher, when you get an MRI of a pitcher's shoulder, a perfectly healthy pitcher pitching will have many abnormal findings on an MRI because it's not normal to pitch a ball 90-something miles right. an hour. And as a result, you get these little partial rotator cuff tears, partial labral tears, and sometimes pitchers will actually have surgery – to address those problems, recover from it, get back to playing, and have, redevelop those symptoms. Because the, the, even though they addressed abnormal findings on an MRI, they find out later that the real symptoms were actually coming from this thoracic outlet syndrome. So it is, it is not, unfortunately, uncommon for this to go undiagnosed. And the reason specifically is when you have a pinched nerve in the neck, we follow, there's uh, MRIs to look for that. There's EMGs that can pick up that study, and we can identify, all right, this is the nerve root that's affected. This is the nerve root that has to get decompressed. If it's a pinched nerve in the elbow, the EMG finds different things. It says, okay, 
this nerve is pinched at the elbow. This is what we have to decompress. In thoracic outlet syndrome, the EMG findings are a little bit more variable, not as uh, consistent. MRIs don't find things unless there's a actually like an abnormal anatomic variant, like somebody has an extra bone, which is possible, or an extra muscle that can lead to impingement there. But these aren't uh, the more common scenarios, unfortunately, and that's why it just takes so long to diagnose. All right, here's the biggest pro and, and last one. I know Mike is waiting to get back on some other more important stuff. But the, the biggest issue, and I, I don't even know if issue is the right term to describe my belief in this. I understand this exists. I understand this is a condition. I understand how you laid it out, that at times it might take a little longer to diagnose. Hey, even a misdiagnosis, it happens. Nobody's perfect. But I go back to the pain element. And Markel Fultz, multiple times while dealing with this condition, made it clear that he's pain-free. And we had seen him on the floor multiple times shoot and then talk afterwards like he's pain-free. So the issue that I think the cloud of doubt that surrounds with specifically Fultz, doctor, is the coming and going of the pain specifically surrounding bad games or bad moments as opposed to it being more consistent where, hey, you're throwing that ball 98 miles per hour, it's going to hurt regardless. Yeah, so I, I won't argue with that at all. And honestly, you know, obviously we don't have a chance to examine Markel Fultz sure, and look at all the that. studies and all that kind of stuff. You know, is it possible that, you know, he's just a bust and this is the diagnosis they're coming up with, try to complain or you know, blame his poor play on it's absolutely possible. You know, from afar, you want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt, but I definitely can't tell you for sure that that's not the case. Um, that being said, they did a lot of treatment for scapular imbalance last year, a lot of rehab and all that kind of stuff. And the treatment for scapular imbalance, a lot of that, the therapy will overlap with the treatment for this problem. So if, in fact, he has thoracic outlet syndrome and they did treatment for, to address the scapular imbalance, that could actually lead to an improvement of his symptoms because by improving, improving on the scapular imbalance, it will take a little pressure off the nerve roots there. And uh, it's possible that that could be part of the reason why he maybe had less pain. But I definitely will not go out on a limb and say 100% certain that this guy has thoracic outlet syndrome that explains everything and a surgery is going to make him the number one prospect we all thought. You know, right. I hope that's the case, but I definitely can't tell you that from afar. Yeah. Now, and, and, and Doc, I know – the timeline thing for a lot of people it is just a bizarre story but you know the guy plays last year for eight games then he has the shoulder imbalance you and i discussed it he misses 68 games he then comes back there's really no evidence in those short games that he played that he was this outstanding player that they drafted number one then the offseason comes and they say well he shoots the ball 1500 times you know, so is there a possibility that he had this imbalance and then he came back from it and then this TOS was kind of there and no one still kind of figured it out. And then because he took the season off for a couple of weeks, he takes two to three weeks off before he starts his off-season workout, that that rest was enough for him to kind of start ramping back up. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely possible that by – because, you know, we talked about in Major League Baseball players, for example, it, it's that forceful repetitive action that leads to the symptoms. So if they just stop playing baseball, their symptoms are going to get better, right? And there right. are some people that will get it with daily activities that are, aren't sports-related, and usually they have those anatomic variants that put them at risk for this problem. But, yeah, if you take away – the risk factor, which is that repetitive overhead motion, it's going to make him feel a lot better, and it's definitely possible that he, he starts to play a little better, start shooting a little better, and then once he starts actually putting up all those shots over and over again, he starts developing the symptoms again. So um, if the symptoms can wax and wane from that standpoint. Um, you know, honestly, with all the stuff that we're hearing, my biggest concern is that they're, they're throwing up these dates that he might be coming back in three to six weeks. You know, I, I I can't imagine that after all the rehab he had last year and he came back and had the symptoms again, that three weeks of rehab, he's going to be back to shooting up with perfect form. You know, right. um, I think that's being a little optimistic to say the least. Um, physical therapy has been shown to be helpful for this condition, and hopefully that's all I need. Um, but, you know, I think a three- to six-week timeline is probably going to be uh, an unlikely um, outcome. Uh, real quick, while we have uh, Dr. Kevin McHale from Cape Regional and Penn Orthopedics, there was some news today that it looks like Alex Smith's career could be over. Now, we saw that gruesome injury that he had a couple of weeks ago, 
broken leg, compound and spiral fracture. He's now dealing with an infection caused by complications from multiple surgeries. He's been in the hospital since November the 18th. Uh, following surgery to repair everything. He has all these different things. So, obviously, this was a gruesome, gruesome injury. I I'm assuming that you're not surprised to hear that his career could potentially be over. But compound fracture, spiral fracture, this sounds like a, a, a one of these that you only see maybe once in a lifetime. Well, I mean, well, unfortunately, in orthopedics, we see open fractures a, more, a, lot, a lot more than once in a lifetime. But um, an open fracture or a compound fracture, when those bones uh, stick through the skin, they are much more concerning than what we call a closed fracture, one that obviously the bones aren't protruding through the skin. And, and the reason is that there's a much higher risk of infection. And unfortunately, you know, Alex Smith did develop an infection. We kind of consider all these pro athletes to be, you know, these superheroes that never have complications and they heal perfectly. And every timeline we give them is going to go right on track. And then when you have a complication like this, you realize that, you know, that's not always the case. Um, with these open fractures, uh, the surgeons did everything. It sounds like they did everything right. They got them right to the operating room very quickly. You had surgery that day. Typically, you wash everything out and remove any of the uh, surrounding tissue that looks damaged. Uh, and if they can, they close it up that day and put a rod down the leg to fix that spiral fracture. And a lot of times, that's all you need, and, and it goes on to heal, and it's fine. For these uh, bigger injuries, if that soft tissue, that skin is really damaged, sometimes there's poor healing at that site. You can get fra uh, infections there. And depending on the severity of infection, it can require multiple, uh, what we call a debridement procedure, a clean-out procedure to get rid of all that infected tissue, IV antibiotics, uh, and sometimes even, you know, taking that rod back out and putting antibiotics inside the bone to treat it. So hopefully that's not the case. You know, hopefully after they get all these washouts, get that soft tissue to heal and, and get some IV antibiotics, you'll be back on course. Um, but, you know, it's, it's obviously a devastating complication, and it's really unfortunate to hear. Yeah, sad news, uh, gruesome injury. And you're right, you probably see people who suffer, you know, in car accidents and all sorts of stuff. We're just thinking on, the, I guess, the mindset of professional athletes coming in with this type of injury. Uh, you don't see, you know, that, that kind of gruesomeness all that often. But uh, Dr. Kevin McHale, kind enough to join us uh, on Tuesday's show, back with us today uh, with our injury report brought to you by Penn Orthopedics and Cape Regional Health System. The best of both worlds for a healthier life. For an appointment, 609-463-CAPE or visit kateregional.com slash orthopedics. Doc, thank you so much. Enjoy the football. Thank you, sir. All right. Yep, no problem, guys. we got a big game Sunday. Hopefully we'll uh, be bouncing off a win next week. <laughs> Let's hope, man.